to work are able to watch it later. So good morning, Facebook book, and good morning, YouTube, and good morning, congregation. We're going to, we're going to be in the book of Daniel this morning. The title of the message is, Why Fast? Or Fasting, Why? We're just going to start in the book of Daniel. We're going to go to a number of scriptures. But Daniel chapter 9, uh, I'm just going to bring a passage of scripture to you that, I, that is familiar. It's a familiar theme throughout the scripture, but I thought I'd just use Daniel as the springboard to talk about this this morning. Daniel chapter 9, beginning in the second verse. Daniel chapter 9, beginning in the second verse. And ha the uh, screen has gone dead, Steve, or I, I don't know. Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I'm just going to bring to your attention this morning, Daniel, we know, was a man of prayer. This happens before the lion's den, even though in the scripture it's after the lion's den. Notice that it's the first year of the reign of Darius, and Darius is the king that ends up having Daniel put in the lion's den. If you remember the story, it wasn't Darius's des desire to put him in the lion's den, but he got tricked, so to speak, into putting Daniel in the lion's den. But this takes place before that happens. It's the first year of Darius the Mede, and, um, and he was reading in the scripture, and he realizes that Israel got caught, was taken captive, you know the story, to Babylon. And the temple was destroyed, the walls were destroyed, and Israel was laid waste. And God had prophesied that that was going to happen and that they would be taken captive for 70 years. Jeremiah was the one who prophesied it would be a 70-year uh, time that they would be, uh, that Israel would be under the judgment of the Lord. And so Daniel, having read that and knowing when he was taken captive and knowing uh, when Israel was, was captured by Nebuchadnezzar, then he sees that it's, that it's time to happen. And it's interesting because this, this always fascinates me, you find in the scripture. Daniel read in the scripture that God said it was, be, was going to be 70 years. So Daniel prayed with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. The first question I would ask is, if God said it's going to happen in 70 years, why bother praying? Because God said it was going to happen. And you have to understand something about the kingdom of God and the ways of God is that God operates and has limited himself to operating in the earth through humanity. He's obviously sovereign. He can do what he wants outside of humanity, but he operates through humanity and limits himself through humanity. So he tells what's going to happen so that people see what's going to happen and start praying for his, his will to be done. I could tell you another story in, in 1 Kings chapter 18. The Lord spoke to Elijah and said there had been a three and a half year drought. And the Lord said to Elijah, go, show yourself to, to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. I will send rain. So Elijah appeared to, so Elijah went and showed himself to Ahab the king, and they had a conversation, and Ahab left. And then something interesting happened. Elijah started praying. For what? For rain. Why are you praying for rain, Elijah? God already said he was going to send rain. And you know the story, Elijah prayed and sent his servant and said, go look, see if there's any sign of rain. And the servant went and he saw no sign of rain. And he did this seven times. And on the seventh time, the servant came back and said, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. And Elijah said, that's it. And took off running because rain came and a torrential downpour and the famine was over. Go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain. And then Elijah started praying. And in this case... Daniel read in the scripture, 70 years is going to be accomplished, and then Israel will return. And Daniel started praying. And it teaches us this principle. 
Jesus teaches it in the New Testament. And I've said this so many times, but I remind you. Jesus said, when you pray, pray you therefore after this manner, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Did you realize that you are the touchstone for the will of God to be done on earth? So why would Jesus tell you to pray that? Because his will isn't done on earth as it is in heaven. And the evidence that his will isn't done is that people are suffering and there's pain and there's sorrow and there's misery and there's none of that in his kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And so the mindset that everything that happens is the will of God is a false mindset. God's will is not being done. I had a guy say to me one day, he said, so you're a Christian? I said, yes, I am. He said, what kind of Christian? I said, I'm the worst kind. He said, the worst kind? I said, yeah, I'm a literalist. I believe the whole thing. I t I, he goes, oh, and this was, not short, this was not long after the Boxing Day tsunami. He said, so you're okay with 250,000 people being killed? I said, you, that's not God's fault. You think that's God's fault? God is not willing that any should perish. We live in a planet that is, that, that is fallen because of sin. And because of sin, not only is man fallen and, walking, and working outside of the will of God, creation is working outside of the will of God. How do you know? Because one day he says, I'm going to come and put it back in order. When I put it back in order, then you'll know my, what my will really is. But until then, you're my touchstone. You pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's why it's so important that we take prayer seriously. But this morning, I want to talk about this concept of why do you have to add fasting? Why did Daniel add fasting? What is fasting about? Why can't we just pray? What's, what, this whole, what is this whole, whole concept of fasting? And so I'm just going to bring it to your attention this morning. Fasting, why? Well, one reason that we fast is because Jesus did. You see it in the scripture. Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. So Jesus fasted. We're going to look at, at the benefits of fasting in a minute, but, but why? Well, one of the things that we see in this temptation is that after the end of the 40-day fast, the devil came to him and he went through a time of temptation. What we do understand about fasting is it increases spiritual sensitivity. It increases spiritual sensitivity. You get sensitive to that other world when you let go of this world. That's why you hear me talk about waiting upon the Lord. Because if you get away from that world and spend time in his world, you get more sensitive to his voice, his word, his will, and his way. So Jesus fasted. So why do we fast? Well, number one, we fast because Jesus did. Number two, we fast because Jesus expects us to. He expects us to. You see it, Matthew 16 Jesus is teaching, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. So he teaches how to fast. They disfigure their faces that they may be seen with men by men. I, they have their reward. When you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who's in secret place, your Father who's in secret, will reward you openly. In other words, we're not fasting to show off. We're not fasting to say, hey, check me out, look how spiritual I am. So he, he says, and when he says, when you fast, not if you fast. When you fast. It's going to be a part of your regimen. Why? Well, because it was part of his regimen. And we'll see again what are the benefits, but Jesus expects us to fast. Why else do we fast? The next reason we fast is because the first church fasted. Acts 13. This is fascinating to me. Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. 
And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, notice the phrase, they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Part of ministry to the Lord is fasting. It is saying, Lord, I'm going to separate myself for a season from whatever this is. And of course, the Bible form of fasting is food. I know we fast other things today. And I don't think it's entirely inappropriate, but the biblical form of fasting is fasting food. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now speak, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work which I've called them. Then having fasted and prayed, laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Verse 3, having fasted and prayed. So they prayed and they fasted. And it went together. So the early church was praying and fasting, and the reason I bring it up is because in some circles in today's Christianity, fasting is not part of the discipline. And if it's not part of the discipline, we're missing, number one, that Jesus did it. Jesus expects us to fast. He said, when you fast, and that the early church fasted. So we can't bemoan that we're not seeing what the early church saw if we're not doing what the early church did. I'll say that again because I think it's good enough to repeat. We cannot bemoan that we're not seeing what the early church saw if we're not doing what the early church did. Amen. So hence the purpose of the fast. And I know we're two weeks into it, and it's kind of late to get started, but if you haven't been fasting, maybe this, this will encourage you to at least pick up the fast for a week, or for a day, or for however. I got it out of order, but the next one is also because the first, and this is another passage of scripture, when they appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commanded, commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They prayed with fasting. So they fasted as they prayed for elders, looking for the Lord's direction on who should be the elders and laying hands on them, praying with fasting. Why? Because Fasting increases spiritual sensitivity, and we need to know who those elders are. Amen? Amen. Fasting. Why? Because it's a sign of contrition. Joel says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. So rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Fasting is a way of, tar- of saying to the Lord, I'm contrite, I'm repentant. I remember early in my walk with the Lord, a minister stood up and he said, whenever my flesh gets out of control, I go on a fast. And I thought to myself, if I had the discipline to fast, my flesh wouldn't get out of control. <laughs> I don't have the strength to fast. But fasting is a sign of contrition. Turn to me. It's just saying, Lord, I'm serious about my pursuit of you. I'm serious about coming after you. I'm serious about following you. I'm coming, Lord, with all my heart. And I'm contrite. Fasting, because it's a sign of contrition. Then it goes on to say, why? Because it humbles us. 35th Psalm, as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart. I would pray, meditate. I humbled myself with fasting. Has anyone found that as they're trying to fast this week, there's a humility that goes with it? Hard to fast and be proud, because you realize whatever it is you're fasting, how much power it had over you when it's beckoning you, or when you're hungry, or when you're struggling. You're saying, man, I'm, I'm, I can't wait for this to be over. Oh, it's a, it's a humbling thing to see how strong it was. And then we turn to Isaiah 58, which is called the fasting chapter. If you don't know it, you should turn to it. You should know it. You should read it because the, almost the entire chapter deals with the issue of fasting. The first half of it starts out dealing with the fast as it's not supposed to be. And God says, you, you're not getting any answers during your fast because you're violating your fast. And so, so I did not take the time to go through the violation of the fast. Then he turns to the positive and says, 
this is the fast that I've chosen. This is the purpose of the fast. This is the type of fast. This is what the fast does. God cares for people. Why fast? Because in the fast, not only are you praying for your own spiritual sensitivity, but all spiritual sensitivity and all Christianity turns into service and to ministry to other people. There's no such thing as Christianity that is just solely consumed upon ourselves. If you're Christian for yourself, you're Christian not at all. Your Christianity has to manifest itself in ministry outside of yourself or you're not Christian. It is how we minister and treat and relate to other people that Christianity becomes real. It's how it's measured. It's how we know we're Christians. We could go into a monastery, that's what we've been talking about in the Celtic way of evangelism, that the Roman form was to withdraw from the world, become a monk, and go into a monastery and, and study holiness. But you can't be a Christian apart from people. And our Christianity has to manifest itself in love and in service. That's how people know you're Christians. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. So if we're fasting and not ministering, we're incomplete. So why fast? Well, this is the, all I did is I put check, check marks there. But this is the quote of the scripture. Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness? The New Living Testament says to free those who are wrongly imprisoned. We've got to be a people who love justice and hate unrighteousness. To undo heavy burdens, to lighten the burden of those who work for you, the New Living Testament says we are to be a people who let people go, to let the oppressed go free. And that you break every yoke, remove chains that bind people. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? Is it not to bring your home to the, your house the poor who are cast out when you see the naked that you cover him? And don't hide yourself from your own flesh. And the NLT tells you, don't hide from your relatives. In other words, look for the hungry, look for the poor, look for the hurting and minister to them. If you're fasting only to yourself and, and you don't fast for men to see that you're fasting and put on uh, you know, tears and ashes and everything else, but at the same time, there has to be an outward manifestation of your Christianity in serving and ministering to others, looking for the downcast, the downtrodden, the poor, the helpless, those who are, have suffered injustice. That's our walk and that's our work. And I would say to you that this, like fasting, is inconvenient because I have rarely found hurting people who come to me when it's convenient for me. As a matter of fact, if I make him Lord, I have to make him Lord over my conveniences and over my time, that he may be Lord of all. If he's only Lord when it's convenient, then again, he's not Lord. Amen? God cares for people. And he wants, and then finally, in this staying in Isaiah 58, the next passage, uh, he says, this is what the result of the fast. Then you will. Your light shall break forth in the morning. When our fasting is right in our heart, when our fasting is right in our community, then God says, your light shall break forth. What's it mean? It means testimony. You know one of the useless facts I watched this week, which I thought was useful to me, is that every human being, this is what they said, whether it's accurate or not, I'm just telling you what they said, that every human being emits enough energy that if you had the ability to see it, every human being shines light. I've always suspected that to begin with anyway. And that, that we don't have, we can't see it, but there's enough energy coming from us that we would, we, we would glow. This is absolutely biblical. This is absolutely what the scripture says, that we are clothed with the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You've heard me say this before, but just in case, 
The reason Adam and Eve knew that they were naked is, naked is because they lost the glory. And once they lost the glory, they saw each other's nakedness. And I know that there are people today who have trouble with Christianity and, and nakedness because the human body is beautiful, we should celebrate it. But the issue is not that the human body isn't beautiful, but the fact that you can see the human body is the problem. Because clothed with the glory of God, we would shine like megawatt light bulbs. It is my surmise, my, my, I take this from biblical passages, that in heaven, Part of the reward system will be the different brightnesses or the glory with which we have when we get to heaven, part of the reward system. There will be some who are like generals who will glow and some who will be privates who will glow like, uh, like night lights and others who glow like stadium lights. And you'll be able to look and see, this is just my, but you'll be able to look and see their reward system by the glory. And their, their authority, because scripture gives us the indication there's an authority structure in heaven, and that we'll be rulers of different sizes, different amounts, and all of those different things, not only by the size of the crown and the jewels of the crown, but I believe by the glory. Whether that turns out to be true or not, you can correct me when we get there and, and, uh, and set me straight and say, man, well, you were so off on that. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. Again, the, the, the natural world knows that there are fasting benefits. And we don't only fast for the healing benefits or for the physical benefits, but there are physical benefits that go alongside of fasting. And they will tell us things like giving your digestive system a rest. I heard one minister do a sermon one time, and in the sermon he said he believed that God's original intention is that we fasted on the Sabbath which is why you didn't, they didn't pick man, weren't given manna on the Sabbath. They could get double the amount on the day before, but the, his, again, whether you take that serious or not, the one day fast, putting the body through rest, we all know that there's a fast between the time we go to sleep and the time we wake up, the morning we eat the break fast in the morning. And we fast for however long it's been since we've eaten, and some of us get up and have a midnight snack so that we don't have to go fasting too long, but that's a whole nother story. Your righteousness shall go before you. Problems that you have with your flesh can be overcome through fasting because learning to discipline the body is part of Christianity. Learning to bring the body under subjection. Now we've all done this to one degree or another because you get up out of bed to go to work. You got up out of bed to get to to come to church this morning, but there are some people who do not have the discipline to get up out of bed, and their flesh is stronger than their, than their need to get out of bed. So even though they need to get out of bed, I know that there are people who can't keep a job because they can't get out of bed. And the difficult, the problem is they just haven't disciplined the body. Everyone knows we can if we need to. I promise you tomorrow, if someone came along and said, I'll give you a million dollars if you'll be at my place tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, you'd be amazed how easy it would be to get up out of bed. Say, well, I'm not the kind of person who gets up that, that early. Bet you do tomorrow. So the issue isn't the, isn't the discipline, it's the motivation. And then the discipline. And so whatever area, I'm just making that as an example, there are many areas of our life that we need discipline. Discipline not to gossip. Discipline not to complain. Tongue disciplines. Discipline, discipline to practice joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Practice joy. To, to celebrate the goodness of the Lord. To meditate on the, good, on the things. Whatsoever is good, just, holy, true. If there be anything praiseworthy, if, if, the, if it's anything good, meditate on these things. The discipline of thinking on the positive is a discipline bringing your flesh into subjection. The natural mind finds the negative. He's attracted. He, it's attractive, attracted to the negative. It's easy to find the negative. I heard a man say years ago in a sermon that, it's, that any sinner can preach how sinful we are. Anyone can get up here and berate one another about our failures. It doesn't take a spiritual man to do that. It takes a spiritual man to find 
that God's goodness that rests over us and draw out that higher calling to pursue the good high calling of God and to see the good in people and to see what God can do, the potential in people. That is the spiritual man. And so testimony, victory, the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. That's protection, Holy Spirit protection. Not, uh, and all of us could give testimony of times that we know the Lord protected us and God watched out over us. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. This is intimacy, fellowship with the Lord, praying and feeling and sensing the Lord's, not only is the Lord's presence, but getting answers to prayer. This is the, the measure of prayer is in the answer. If we pray and don't get answers, we have to become students of prayer and learn what do we need to do to get answers because there's, there's a value in praying, meditating, being still, thinking on these things, but the strength of prayer is in the answer. Jesus wants us to pray in such a way that we get answers. This is the indication that we're children. Which of you having a son or a child would ask for bread, would you give him a stone? My heavenly Father knows what th things you have need of before you ask. Ask, you shall receive. Seek, you will find. Knock, the door will be open. These are promises that God gives to us that we should expect answers. And I know that there are some answers that are not yet or not now or no, but there are other things where God is saying, press on, stay on, keep praying, keep believing, and you might need to ask, add praying, fasting to this praying, to increase your sensitivity so that I can do what you're wanting, to, wanting me to do. So you remember the story of the disciples that tried to cast out the spirit of the, of the girl, of the, of the child, and they couldn't. Jesus and the disciples came from the mountain, and Peter and John came from the, the, James, Peter, and John came down from the mountain, and they found this going on, and he said, Jesus says, what's going on? They said, well, we tried to cast the spirit out. It wouldn't leave. And so Jesus sighed and said, how long do I have to deal with you folks? And he cast the spirit out of the child. And then they turned to Jesus and said, well, how come we couldn't cast it out? And he said, "This kind, he said, because of your lack of faith, howbeit this kind only goes by prayer and fasting. Something about the fasting that increases spiritual strength and stamina and sensitivity that increases then you should cry, he'll answer. You'll cry, he'll say, here I am. The next thing is guidance. The Lord will guide you continually. Next one is satisfaction. Satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You'll be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. This is ministry again, that people can come and drink from your life. Remember, the, fruits of re the seeds of reproduction are in the fruit. And so you want to be bearing love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and the like, because the seeds of reproduction are in those character traits. Jesus said, or God says in the scripture, these are the results of fasting. So this is where I'm going to go off, um, off my notes into a passage of scripture. Matthew chapter 11, I'm going to finish here this morning. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, and I've got to pull up a passage of scripture in the, in the message, and I've got, to, I've got to get it real quick. I texted it to someone, so I actually have it in a text. Uh, so. so Matthew chapter 11, beginning in... Verse 28. Matthew 11:28. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So we sang this morning during worship, so I wait for you. And then we quoted or sang Isaiah 40, 31, I think. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They that wait upon the Lord. That term wait does not mean it, 
It actually means wait as a waiter in a restaurant. They that serve wait upon the Lord that come. Remember, they ministered to the Lord and fasted. It's not wait for you to do your thing, God. I'm waiting. It is how may I come into your presence, give you praise and worship and minister to you in such a way that I might come into your presence and get from you whatever it is you have for them whatever you have for them. Remember the story of Luke chapter 11, where he comes to his neighbor. He says, a friend of mine has come to me at midnight, and I have nothing to set before him. This is a picture of ministry, because it's the midnight hour, and we've got to have something to give people. And so he went to his neighbor, and his neighbor says, do not trouble me, for I'm in bed. My kids are in bed with me. And Jesus said, though he would not rise and give him, because he was his friend, because of his, the King James Version uses the word importunity, his persistence, he will rise and give him as much as he needs. This is what God is speaking and teaching us. It's a midnight hour. We, we have to have something for people. We have to have something for people. We have to have something for people. People don't need your wisdom, your intellect, your knowledge. Smart as you are, they don't need that. There's, there's no shortage of a worldly people's opinions and people's, they need something that comes fresh, fresh baked bread from heaven. You say, well, what does it look like when there's fresh, fresh baked bread from heaven? The difference is not the words that you say, but the anointing that rests upon the words that you say. I remember being in a service of thousands, and the minister that was up, up front walked up to the platform. We just had a tremendous worship service with presence of the Lord flowing like a breeze across the place. He walked up to the front, and he said, we need to pray more. And when he said those words, it hit me in the chest with so much power this is on it. I was in the aisles it's, uh, at the front, at the cent back, but had an open in front of me that I literally fell off that seat onto my face, beginning to cry out to God because the words had so much power in them that I was compelled to pray. That's fresh baked bread. Imagine if you told someone Jesus loves you and it fed them and wasn't just words coming out of natural man to natural man. It's truth, but those who have ears to hear will understand what I'm saying when I say there's a difference between human speak and heaven speak. And it may not be in the words themselves, and what, what hinders us many times is we think because we can speak heaven's words, we don't have heaven's anointing, and we're speaking heaven's word and we're her words, and we're misguided into thinking we're ministering the word of God, but we're really not giving bread from heaven because we haven't been in his presence and don't have something fresh baked. So you can minister to someone and comfort someone and counsel someone and lead someone and guide someone, Jesus said, if you come to me, if you come to me, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For, my, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The reason I wear tennis shoes in the pulpit is this passage of scripture. A number of years ago, I was going through a tough time spiritually, and it was Sunday morning, and I was heavy laden, and I was getting ready to get up and preach a heavy message. And the Holy Spirit whispered to me, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. My burden is light, don't you dare go in there and lay this burden on those people. And so to remind me of that, I stopped wearing dress shoes and started wearing tennis shoes because for whatever reason, they make me feel light. And they're a reminder every week in the mornings when I get dressed and in the pulpit, keep it light. Why? Because my burden is light. Don't you go in there and lay a heavy burden on people. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. 
To be yoked with the Lord means that he's easy to walk with. He's easy to walk with. The only problem we have is we chafe. So take my yoke on you and walk with me. It's, it's not that hard to understand getting into a yoke with the Lord. It, we don't often see yokes today. But it just, it's as simple as thinking of an escalator. Let the escalator do the work. You just get in him, in Christ. If any man be in, get on the escalator and it'll get you where you want to go. Or a ski lift. A lot of people have been chewed up by ski lifts. But if you get on a ski lift, it'll get you where you want to go. It just means if you'll stay with me, I'll take you where you want to go. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. What, where do you want to go? Well, I want to have peace. He says, well, you've come to the right place, you who are labor and heavy laden. So I was st reading this, this this week, and as, as is my want, um, sometimes I go to other ver versions to see how do they paraphrase it. The message is a paraphrase. It's not a translation. But I thought, I want to see how Eugene Peterson paraphrased this. Here's how he wrote it. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. I love this line. This is, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And that surely ministered to me the morning I read it. I love that line, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I conclude with this years ago. And I have been one, like probably many of you, I have been one who has struggled with striving. Comparing myself to others, I'm not good enough. Wanting to be better, wanting to do better, struggled with, stri struggled with striving. I've struggled with depression, like many of you. And in the earlier years, years ago, it was pretty severe. It's been years now that when, it, when I do, it's much, much lighter than what it used to be. It used to be debilitating and I think maturity and spirituality, mature spiritual growth and age probably um, helps with all of those things. And, and so I was driving down the road in a car and I was heavy and the weight of life was on my shoulders and um, there's a song written by a man named Keith Green, he was singing it. My child, my child, why are you striving? You can't add one thing to what's been done for you. I did it all while I was dying. You just lay back in the grace I have told you. Because when I hear the praises start, I want to rain upon you blessings that will fill your heart. For I see no stain upon you. You are my child, and I love you. To me, you're only holy. Nothing that you've done will remain only what you do in me. And as he sang those words, it was, he talked about the anointing, about words having heaven sent, heaven's strength. It was as if God himself was speaking to me that morning as I drove in the car. My child, my child, why are you striving? You can't add one thing to what's been done for you. I did it all while I was dying. You just lay back and trust in the words I've told you. And I wept and I released that morning under the, the yoke and the burden of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why fast? Why fast? Not to put a heavy yoke on you. Not to make you religiously proud. None of those things. But to say, Lord, I'm hungry for you. I'm hungry for you. And I'm willing to separate myself for a season, if it's for a day, or for a meal, or for a week, if I go, whatever strength, spiritual maturity, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing this as unto you. 
so that the benefits and blessings might rest upon me, so that the anointing might flow through me, so that I might minister to others and your name might be glorified. I fast for your glory, Lord. I want to learn to walk in the rhythms of your grace. David, would you come to the piano, play whatever's on your heart? We're going to, we've got, we're going to spend, if you have to leave, you can, but we're going to spend a few minutes just getting still before the Lord and just letting God speak to us because if you're heavy laden this morning, if you're struggling or stressed, if you've got life's, hey, listen, most of you know I've been going through it with my mom and this is a new season where I need new grace. It's tougher than I thought it would be. And, and it's not easy. I don't want to talk about it. People come and say, how's your mom? I don't want to talk about it. I, I'm just dealing. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'm just walking and, get, and trusting the Lord for grace step by step. And we're doing what we have to do. She's in a nursing home right now working on rehab just to update you very quickly. And uh, working on rehab. And hopefully tomorrow she'll get rehab. The doctors don't have a lot of hope that rehab will, will be effective. My dad has a lot of hope that rehab will, naturally. So it remains to be seen where we go from here in the weeks and months to come. But, um, but that's, that's, that's mine and Deb's uh, um, uh, walk. It's our, it's our walk. And there's grace for every season. So thank you for your concerns and your care and your love and your suggestions and your comments and all that go with it. So before we go home this morning, Lord, you know who needs rest today. 